as you know, I'm Susan Holson, the Director of Education Services at VSBA. We're really happy to have you here today. I'm, I've got Patrick Halliday here with me and Jess DeCarolis, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Jess, who are both from the Agency of Education. Patrick, of course, you've met before in our webinars and our regional meetings. He is the guru of the annual snapshot, although I don't think that's his official title at the agency. Um, and Jess, remind me again, your title is? I'm Division Director of the Student Pathways Division at the agency. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna turn this over to them and, um, learn along with everybody else. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, great. Good. Um, so thanks everyone for having us today. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Halliday. I'm the Director of the Education Quality Division at the agency and uh, along with Jess, um, uh, we are really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you today um, about equity and data and uh, our divisions both take this on come from slightly different directions but with similar goals and working on it um you know, just a couple of opening thoughts about this uh, our previous secretary rebecca holcomb used to argue that there's no greater role than uh in the education department than the ed education uh, agency than to uh to, to protect vulnerable kids um Governor Scott has one of his three priorities is protecting Vermont's vulnerable citizens. And when uh, our current secretary will often talk about being in conversations with his peers in other states and uh, when he'll raise issues of equity, uh, they're not even on the radar of others. So it's something that is built in across the um, uh, the work that we're doing in Vermont and really appreciate the the, uh, the school boards coming in to do this as well. And uh, and very briefly, uh, now I, I, I used to be one of you as well. Uh, I was a member of the Vermont or the uh, Burlington School Board and actually uh, the chair uh, for a short time. Uh, so I can uh, appreciate the work you do and, and, and offline commiserate at times with the, the, the thanklessness of the job. Um, but uh, so thanks for coming in and um, we appreciate. So we're going to jump in just talking to start a little bit about uh, our just general logic around uh, assessment at the state level. So it's kind of three different parts. We have uh, something that needs to be learned um, and uh, curriculum or learning uh, standards that need to be met. Those can come in lots of different forms. Uh, the examples we have up here, Common Core, uh, the um, Next Generation Science Standards, National Core Art Standards are all standards. And then there's a curriculum that's kind of the, the map to, to ensure those standards are met. And then there's some way that we assess those. Uh, a few, this is not exhaustive, but you know we have the, the SBAC assessments for Common Core, for the, the um, NGSS standards, the National Science Assessment. Um, and these are again at the state level. These are not um, these are not individual districts have additional things to do. And we also have the integrated field reviews, or once every three years we come out into your district with other educators and just kind of ask questions and, and learn a bit more. And all of that is in service to, you know, improving the process, um, uh, whether it be instruction or policy or whatever. Um, so we have continuous improvement plans uh, for this year. We have recovery plans. And then it also, you know, will signal which investments that your um, that, that your school is going, your school system is going to be in, uh, taking in. Uh, looked at a little bit differently. This is a similar idea where we start with the education quality standards. And again, at the state level, um, on the far left, ways to assess those education quality standards and again, leading to continuous improvement. And the reason that I, I bring this up is the annual snapshot is one of the ways uh, that we have historically at the state level been able to talk about uh, and, uh, and the integrated field review, the way that the, the state can get involved to help schools better understand what's going on in their schools. The annual snapshot is designed, you'll see in a minute, to be able to give information at, uh, at the state level, at the SU or SD level, at the school level, uh, even at the grade level within uh, the school and to break down. Um, and again, uh, and, and then to drive that kind of continuous improvement process. Um, Jess, do you want to talk about high quality assessment system? Sure, and I think uh, we have a quote here from uh, Linda Darling Hammond, who many of you may be familiar with, but it's really important when we're thinking about a high quality assessment system that we're, we're thinking about including the higher order cognitive skills and critical abilities 
And, and when you see them listed here as communication collaboration, you can really envision them as the transferable skills that the state adopted, which is understanding that there are cross-cutting skills and abilities across disciplines or content areas that you can, you can assess in all of those content areas, such as science and social studies. It doesn't just happen in one place. It's also really important that, right, they're, they're valid and they're reliable. And I think most importantly here, you can see that they're fair and instructionally sensitive. And really what that, that means is that we're not assessing skills that are, are inappropriate to the content area, that we're not um, necessarily uh, evaluating students based on something that hasn't been uh, transparent for those students. And then most importantly, and I think you saw that in uh, Patrick's opening slide, is that our assessment should always be informing teaching and instruction. Right, and I think one thing that's important, what we've talked about, you, for, you know, look at the high quality assessment system. I think that it's pretty obvious that looking at just what the state does is far from enough. We can provide some context with things like the SBAC assessments and the and what's reported out at the annual snapshot, but the state at the on its own is not sufficient. So we need a balanced assessment system because, you know, as it says here, no assessment's going to capture all of those standards and all of those goals and different assessments um, will, will serve different purposes. Collectively, an assessment, uh, an assessment system is going to be uh, giving a much more holistic picture, and it's important not to over rely on any one measure that we're uh, bringing forward. I don't know if you wanted to add to that or not, Jess. No, I, I, I think, you know, what the one thing I guess I would add is that it's continuously iterative, right? And so you're, you're often making choices about the types of assessments based on what you're learning from those assessments. And so this is kind of what we were just talking about, that it's comprehensive and balanced. Um, it's equitable, differentiated, comprehensive. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and, and th there's not too little assessment, but it's also not something that bogs down the instructional process as well. Um, I don't know if you wanted to, to uh, go further on any of these or not, Jessica. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, this might be something that people can identify with it, with this bullet around not too much and not too little, which is sometimes it can feel like the uh, people talk about this as teaching to the test. And I think this is where some folks feel anxiety about state assessments, where the instruction seems to be solely focused on teaching to some summative assessment. And in fact, actually then takes away from instructional time and getting into that differentiation and comprehensive and equitable piece. So, you know, the not too much, not too little, it's a, a delicate balance, but one in which I think people really do need to attend to. You said something I think really important there too. You referred to things like the SBAC or, or the Vermont Science as, as summative assessments. Those are, you know, those are performance assessments at the end of some sort of learning where students are really demonstrating everything that they've learned. And that is an important part of an assessment system, but is so far from the, the, the totality of what needs to be doing. From in, instead, there are you know the, the, the hundreds of decisions that a individual teacher is making, and um, based on information that he or she is receiving in the classroom, you know, kind of in real time to ensure student understanding, uh, to uh, to inform uh, you know the next day or the next the next uh, half hours lessons, uh, to various sorts of kind of um, benchmark assessments that are kind of marking progress to you know to drive. Uh, some larger uh, decisions, but all of those have to be working in concert with each other. And if we look just at SBACs, we're not really, uh, first of all, it's too late because SBACs are passed and um, and we've, we've lost learning opportunities, but they don't do a lot of these things that, you know, the, that we're, that we're really talking about being able to, you know, to be responsive uh, specifically. And then it brings up issues of, uh, of, of equity because students who have specific needs are not getting those needs met because we're if we just look at kind of what happens at the end of the year as opposed to what's happening all throughout. All right, I'm going to jump into the annual snapshot and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because um, the snapshot uh, is is up. You have access to it. Uh, anyone in the public can can go and look at it. Um, I'm going to give a really high level tour, but I don't. I'm not going to spend a ton of time 
um, simply because there's a lot that we want to be able to get through today. Um, but we're, we're, if there's something specific, please stop, ask us for, for more clarity on it um, as we go forward. So the, the snapshot is made up of a whole bunch of different indicators. There are about 17 different indicators. None of them um, are fully diagnostic. They are uh, a series of thermometers or a series of kind of dipsticks that you put into the oil to see, you know, if you have, and if, you know, to, to get an idea of, of whether something's right or wrong. If I have a temperature, I could have a temperature for lots of different reasons. Uh, I could have a temperature because I'm, I'm really sick or maybe a better example is if, if I take uh, my, my heart rate, I could have an elevated heart rate because I have a heart condition because I just you know ran five miles because I'm walking watching a scary movie. All of those um, uh, is require a, a different sort of response to what's going on. And similarly, in the snapshot, we have uh, a bunch of thermometers. They don't tell us. Uh, they tell us that this is somewhere you might want to look a little bit further to make a better understanding, but they don't tell us specifically what's wrong. It's designed intentionally to look at uh, more holistically at students um, and, and at school systems. I'm sorry, um, at, not at students, but at, at school systems and not just focus on academics. Um, and, um, and it's really meant to situate student schools in its own equity continuum by really focusing in and understanding where the equity challenges where different students are succeeding and struggling um, across uh, across or within a school or within the state. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly. There are a number of things the snapshot is intentionally not designed to do and doesn't do well. It is not good at ranking and comparing schools. It's really not the, not the design of it. It's meant to look at uh, individual schools or individual systems to understand where those problems are, but not how to say, how am I doing next door to, uh, to the neighbors? It's not meant to, to blame schools or shame them uh, to say you're bad, but instead to identify the areas that you might wanna look for improvement. Um, it is not meant to define accountability as only assessment scores. It's not just the SPACs. It's not just the, the PE assessment, but instead it's uh, looking at some indicators around, um, around teacher staffing and around student participation and flexible pathways and investment priorities. And it's not meant to fully represent a school system. Just use the example earlier of talking about social studies. Well, there's no social studies assessment that's built into the annual snapshot. That doesn't mean that social studies is not important. It's just that not everything, because we want to have not too little and not too much, not everything is built into, um, into the snapshot. So it alone is not going to tell you everything you need. So a real quick tour, and I'm gonna move through this quickly, uh, but when you get to the snapshot, notice there is this help button up on the upper right. That provides all sorts of different tours uh, um, and, uh, and user guides that um, they can answer a lot of your questions. There's also a link in there to our helpline that if you have questions, you can drop an email to us for our helpline and, and we're happy to answer those for you. But this is the page that you will land on when you come to the, uh, to the annual snapshot. Um, the snapshot is organized around five different domains. Um, you can see here academic proficiency, personalization, safe, healthy schools, staffing, and investment priorities. And under each one of those domains, there are multiple indicators. So, for example, under academic uh, proficiency, we have an indicator for um, uh, English language arts and for math, but also for graduation rate, uh, for student participation, or, uh, student demonstration of college and career readiness, uh, as well as uh, uh, a few others. Each one of those indicators and each one of those uh, those domains has a rating, and there are two ratings for each of those. One is performance. How are you doing this year on whatever that rating or whatever that indicator uh, is? How is your school? How is your your uh, your SUSD? How is the state doing on that? And the second one is change. Have you gotten better? Have you uh, gotten worse? Have you stayed about the same compared to the previous year? So you'll see those two ratings for it will show up for, for uh, everything that we have if we have data for it. All right. So you'll then see uh, every again, every SU, the state, every school will have uh, a page that looks something like this. This is for each one of those domains. Um, and you will be able to, you know, to see what current performance looks like, 
how is that compared to next uh, to the previous year? And then over on the far right, you'll see this equity index. And really what that's doing is comparing how historically privileged students and his, uh, how historically marginalized students are performing compared to their historically privileged peers. And we define a historically marginalized student as any student who is in a, um, a racial or ethnic minority, is uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch, um, is uh, eligible for special education services, or qualifies as an English learner. So how are those students doing compared to those students who don't fit into one of those categories? How big is that equity performance gap for each one of these uh, indicators and domains? And then how successful has the school been at, um, uh, or the system been at closing that gap from this year compared to, to last year? All right, so back to the, the page, we're gonna take a little look. If you want, you could type in uh, look at any individual uh, school, like I said, or town. I just, for example, took a screenshot here where we typed in Addison County, or sorry to type in Addison. I can see anything that shows up with Addison that I can I can select. However, for our demonstration right here, we're going to look at state level data. So we're clicking on the the. This is all students in Vermont that we're uh, we'll be looking at here, just for an example. All right. So you land on a page that looks a little bit like this. We're going to click on academic proficiency because we're interested just for this demonstration. We're looking uh, a little bit more at academic proficiency. So we would click on that uh, in there. And then I know you can't see this right now because it's really small, but I just want to give you an idea of what shows up in there for the eight indicators under academic proficiency. You'll see those same current performance and change in performance. And then over on the right hand side, that current equity issues and the change in equity from the from the previous year. Um, and we'll focus in a, a little bit on these more. A few things you might want to notice across the top. Um, I'm going to go through these real quickly. Um, every single indicator is weighted. So um, to put together this, this overall rating that's over here under uh, overall performance, um, and some and some are determined by state law, or I'm sorry, federal law. Uh, and to some extent, it really matters on the uh, to, to a large extent, it really matters on the system that's being uh, that's being that we're looking at here. For example, if I'm in an elementary school, I'm not going to have any graduation rate. So that graduation rate is going to show up as zero because I don't graduate students at the elementary school level, for example. Um, let's see here. So we're gonna look a little bit more closely just at one for the example. We're gonna focus in on English language arts just because it's at the top, of the, the, um, uh, the top of the page. We could pick any of these, but we're just gonna take a look at this one uh, for an example. Uh, lots of things to, to look here. Um, in the middle under grade, you will notice that you can select the individual grade that you wanna look at. Right now we're looking at all grades. Uh, so this is for the based on the, the English SVAC, um, English Language Arts SVAC, which is third through ninth graders. So this is all third through ninth graders in Vermont who took that, uh, that test. Uh, if you see up in the top right, it's a student group. We're looking at all students. We could, uh, and I'll show this in a minute, we should could take a drop down uh, of that box and look at particular student groups. We could look at uh, just uh, males. We could look at just females. We could look at um, students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. There are uh, many, many, many different ways that we can uh, slice and dice this data. Um, and we could look at fourth grade girls if we wanted to just look at, you know, uh, some of that information. Um, a couple other things you'll see. So there's a, a scale score and a growth score here. This is a little complicated, uh, well, and an overall score. It's a little complicated. I'm gonna go through it really quickly, but just uh, to know the scale score, is really based on uh, what students did in a particular year. The growth score is really uh, to show what sort of growth individual students have been making uh, compared to their peers over the course of three years. Um, and, it's, and it's a required, uh, the particular metric we're using is not required, but some sort of growth metric is required under that. And then we weight the scale score and the growth score equally to get that overall score. Um, and again, looking at our current performance for that. The performance change is just this year's data under the current performance and 
how uh, how has, is that compared to last year's data? Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it stay about the same? That current equity index, that top right hand box, is um, is looking at how are students uh, in this case how are historically marginalized students performing compared to their historically privileged peers, and it shows that students who uh, who are in that historically marginalized group, which I mentioned, ethnic uh, racial minority. Um, free and reduced lunch uh, eligible for special education or English learners are not performing at the same rate as, uh, as their um, historically privileged peers. And then that bottom right equity index change box is, uh, has the, the, the system been better at closing that gap compared to last year? So how is this year's equity gap compared to last year's equity gap? Um, one thing that confuses people very um, uh, quite a bit, you'll see that there's a total number right underneath where it says English language arts. It says scale, 41,000 students, growth, 26,000 students. You need three years of data uh, for that growth score. So if we we're looking just at third graders, there would be no growth score because you third grade is the first year that you have um, that you have. Uh, SBAC data that uh, available. So uh, our growth number is always going to be um, is always going to be smaller than our scale number. Um, it depends a little bit on what we're looking at, but it, it's in, in in all cases it's going to be smaller than our our scale number. Almost all. All right. So I mentioned there's the student group box up there. Um, we're looking at all students. Now we're looking just at free and reduced lunch. So instead of looking at um, you know how all of the students in the state performed, we're looking just at students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And um, the only other you know in, in these represent that performance. You'll see that um, the number of students that that scale and growth number under English language arts uh, ELA slash reading uh, has gone down because that's just the students who are eligible for that. And then the other thing to notice is when we're looking at current equity index, we're just showing what is the gap in performance between students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch and those students who are not eligible for free and reduced lunch. So as opposed to all historically marginalized students, we're looking just at those who are eligible for um, free and reduced lunch. Now, same thing, except now we're just looking at students who are eligible, uh, who are, who are uh, designated as, as English learners. And there are, again, uh, a whole bunch of different um, drop downs under there that you can look at. Now, we're looking at just English learners in sixth grade in the state. So you'll see that number of total participants has gone down to 91 students in the scale score. So there are only 91 sixth graders in Vermont who took the test in, uh, in the particular year that the screenshot is. Uh, sixth grade English learners who took the test in that particular year. Um, so we're just looking at, um, at those numbers at this point. So sometimes, and this is made up data, uh, sometimes we have suppressed data. You can see these orange boxes here, and that's because our numbers are too small. When we get below um, uh, 11 students, it's, uh, it's the, the data is always suppressed. Uh, and often we get uh, suppressed data, um, and this is totally made up, by the way, this particular one. We often get suppressed data as well, um, what's called complementary suppression. So an easy way to think about this, you can say, well, there are 15 students. How come I can't see that particular data? Because we said it's, it's suppressed if it's fewer than 11 students. Um, the reason would be, if you can imagine, um, a classroom of 15 kids, one student is eligible for free and reduced lunch. Well, I report out all 15 of those kids. I don't report out the one kid who's eligible for free and reduced lunch because we would know that. But then I also don't report out those 14 kids who aren't eligible for free and reduced lunch because if I know the 15 and I know the 14, I can kind of figure out how that one student who is eligible for free and reduced lunch um, performed. And so while it's uh, that's a simplistic uh, example of it, that logic holds where we get a, a lot of uh, suppression going forward. Um, and then I just it's here. Nope. Okay. Before I get to take some, we take some questions for clarity. Um, individual uh, superintendents, individual principals uh, have access to 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 be able to see their suppressed data. So if you have that one student or those uh, ten students who uh, that the public can't see. 
super, uh, principals can see the data in their school, superintendents can see that suppressed data across the supervisory union. That is so much I just threw at you. There have got to be tons of questions, and I'm um, if, if, uh, happy to take any at this point. I do actually have a couple, um, and they both are regarding the NA. Oh, there's more coming. Um, okay. If the report indicates NA for a category, is that just a sampling number issue, or are there other issues? And, and had someone else asked um, with a snapshot also, um, almost all of our schools are NA. Um, it says, yep. what, when would that expect to change? So this, uh, so there are lots of reasons you could have NA that, that, that show up. And um, I'm getting a little ahead because I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the limitations that we have from the snapshot that was just released last month, a week ago, Monday, the 26th, I believe that was. Um, we have a lot of things that that show up NA this year because they weren't assessed last year. For example, if you're looking at your school for this year, you're not going to be getting any information on uh, English language arts, SBAC, or math, or science, or, social, uh, or, or PE, and a variety of other things because those assessments didn't happen due to COVID. So um, the examples for simplicity that we we're just looking at were from previous years. Um, uh, because there is data available for those, but for this year, there's all, there are all sorts of, um, uh, for, which is really from the 1920 school year, the data that was just released, there are all sorts of different reasons that, that, um, that NA is showing up that are, uh, that are mostly COVID really, uh, related. There are some other ways that we get, um, see that NA pop up. Uh, for example, um, I'm, this picture we're looking at right now under high quality staffing, you'll see there's no equity index um, for high quality staffing. That's because that's looking at teachers and not students, and we don't um, collect the demographic information on teachers and report it out that way. Um, so we can't look at, um, uh, we're not looking at, at kind of, uh, we're looking at we're not looking at students, so we're not seeing a performance gap. And also those are school-wide as opposed to, um, there's there's nothing, uh, well, yeah, that, that's that's really the main reason is that, is that we're looking at um, uh, teacher information. Uh, there are a couple of other ways that NAs have shown up uh, over the past uh, that there could be, for example, um, last year was the first year that there was a PE assessment, so there was no, uh, in the, if you look at the 1819 um, annual version of the annual snapshot, there is no PE um, change because that was the first year of the assessment. So we can't see how did they do compared to last year because there was no last year to compare it to. But most of what you're seeing right now, and this is what I was actually going to go into next, this is what the state report card looks like this year for those assessments because none of them occurred in the last year. Other okay. questions? Yes. So the next one may be for you and it may be for Susan Holson. I'm not sure which would answer this. It says, thank you for your timely webinar. I struggle with building board agendas and feel disheartened when this higher level overview of school performances is not given the time it deserves to be better understood. Give this web, given this webinar, I am going to propose that board training this year focus on school performance outcomes. Any ideas of how to present this information in multiple trainings of five to 10 minutes, such that a board member better appreciates the value of this data? Yeah, I, I, um, so one of the things I would start with is, is looking at either your superintendent or your curriculum director, and often the curriculum director is the one who spends the most time digging into the snapshot data and probably has the most facility with uh, with with looking at at the at the snapshot data itself, um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, and one of the things that that we started with is like the snapshot is a helpful tool. It should not be the only thing that you're looking at in that comprehensive um, that comprehensive view of assessment that Jess was talking about in the beginning is really essential to be able to understand, and even more essential this year because of the page that we're looking at right now, where there's a lot of data that just isn't isn't there. It's not present because of, of COVID and there's nothing that, there was no way that we were going to be able to take 
you know, the SBACs last year are certainly not going to be able to do, you know, a PE assessment in person last April. Uh, that just wasn't a, wasn't a possibility. Uh, additionally, though, if there are individual, um, if there are boards, um, I would be happy to kind of talk through what options kind of, you know, one on one with people to, to think about how um, you might want to do that or, uh, or to, um, I guess the other thing I would suggest is going back to that help page that we showed at the very beginning, the very first thing. Um, and there is actually a, a pretty good step by step of most of the things that you're going to encounter in the snapshot and breaking that down into uh, you know five or 10 minute segments might be a nice way to start multiple board meetings. Yeah, I, I would agree, Patrick. I think it, even just looking at those five domains and just knowing that actually trying to cover all of the data in one sitting and then leaving it isn't going to make it um, useful or animate the data in such a way that people can start to ask questions that can direct policy development. So I think that chunking where it's like today we're just going to look at academic proficiency and then maybe ask yourself, well, what what do I not know based on the snapshot? So what do I want to learn more about? Which is where then Patrick's referencing, digging in a little deeper to say, are there some, are there local assessments? Do we want to pull some folks in to ask some questions about how they gain insight from those formative assessments or from the education support team? So I think that that could be a way to have an ongoing conversation so people can develop facility with the data. So um, I have quite a few questions around this piece, and I think it's probably an easy answer. Um, and basically, they're asking why the data only goes back um, two years. And I think it's because that's when you started this database. That's right. that 17, 18 was the first year that the snapshot uh, went public. Right. So right. Are, in the future, are you planning on keeping previous years all the way back to 17, 18? Or? That's right. OK, great. Yeah. So that and yeah, there is a, I was just going to say, I'm sorry to, to, to make people watch as you scroll through things. It drives me crazy when people do it. But you can see right here where it says uh, 2017, 2018. You can click on that button and change the year's view that you have for that. Um, and you can look at multiple years in comparison to each other as well. One thing, if I, I just wanted to point out one thing that um, that you know, this focusing on equity and one of the pro, one of the the the, the, two, the the values of the snapshot in being able to look at particular student groups is when we look at all learners, um, we see certain trends, but when we look at specific groups, we might find different trends within those. Um, and so, being able to sort by individual student characteristics and grade levels and the like really helps a school be able to better understand what the specific need um, in a school is, um, as opposed to saying, yeah, our kids are doing well, but are all of our kids doing well? Are they doing well equally at, at different grades? And uh, as an example for, for this, one thing that we found is that in the math assessment, SVAC, we see um, for all student groups, the highest performance at third grade and a downward trend from third grade uh, all the way through ninth grade, which is the last year of the SBAC. However, and, and, that, and, and that same trend is for, like I said, for all student groups. That continues as well for um, student, uh, for uh, girls, but the decline for girls is not as steep as the, as the decline for every other student group um, that's out there. We don't know why, but it's 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 by digging in that sort of way that we start to be able to understand exactly where uh, the specific needs um, lie. Okay, I have one last question. And if it's too specific and we need to address it in an email, just let me know. Um, but uh, someone asked, um, with their specific SU, it says, um, Improvement shows as improving at the SU level, but is declining at each of the individual school levels. How can that be? I would need to look at the individual ones. Sometimes there can be things that come out a little bit wonky when we look at these. Um, and uh, yeah, um, if, if we'll share, share our emails at the end of this. If, if someone wants to write to me, I can take a look and see if I can make sense of it or find one of our, our really smart data people who, who's good at digging in and uncovering what, what some of those causes might be. 
Perfect. And I'll send you that specific question with that person's email as well. Sure. That'd be great. I did want to just say that even though uh, in 2018 or 1920, the data that's just been released, we have a lot of things that are not included in there. There's still a lot of things that you can find. And, and I think that this is important to look at. One example, um, looking again statewide, looking at uh, students who are eligible, um, uh, who, are, who are designated as English learners, we see that their performance is not meeting the goal that we have. And, uh, and their performance is declining this year compared to last year. That's a concern. Um, and something that you know we're, we're seeing as a state pattern, and, and something that we need to be aware of to you know to inform policy. Uh, Jess can talk about this much more smartly than I can, but we're looking at, at uh, student participation in flexible pathways. Um, that we notice that, and this isn't even necessarily performance in flexible pathways, but just just are they are they signing up? Are they taking advantage of the flexible pathways that are offered? And we're seeing that in uh, the 1920 school year, that if you're from one of those historically marginalized groups, you are not participating in flexible pathways at the same rate as students who are in a historically privileged group. And I don't know if you want to add anything that, to that, Jess, or not, but it's it's a trend that that you know that we're seeing in the um, uh, in the snapshot. Yeah. Well. I don't want to take us down a wormhole, but I do think that this actually gets at that um, practice of saying, what is an overarching snapshot? And then how can you start to dig in a little bit deeper to identify, you know, flexible pathways is a very big grouping. You're talking about work-based learning, career technical education, early college, dual enrollment, extended learning opportunities, and the list can go on. And so to the degree that this is a, a representation, when you dig into those different flexible pathways, you're going to see different performance outcomes. We, we do have different legislative reports um, that speak to this, but I think this is a great example of where you wanna then ask more questions and get more granular information based on this causing you to say, I wonder why this is happening. Yep. And if we're talking about the that you know these being uh, uh, kind of a, a, a pulse check, um, looking at this, this is gosh, my pulse is higher than it should be. What is the test that I need to follow? Do I need to have an ultrasound? Do I need to to go for an MRI or I don't know the bad examples? I'm, I'm clearly not a medical doctor, but you know what is the next step? That this is a signal that something's wrong, but trying to figure out exactly what that is requires more work. One thing that we're uh, following fairly carefully right now, and this is looking uh, particularly at this bottom one, educator retention, and this is the number of teachers uh, who have percentage of teachers who have been in their current placement for at least three years. Um, right now, it's about what we'd expect. There's always going to be some sort of natural turnover for uh, for for educators. It, it just it happens. We are hearing uh, locally, statewide, and nationally of really big teacher turnover um, rates that are coming over so, uh, that, are, that are there. And um, we're in, in other kind of anecdotal and, and, and actually quantitative um, uh, evidence that, that, that this is taking place. Based on 1920 data, we're still not seeing you know, big moves in the number of, uh, in the amount of turnover that we're seeing or uh, uh, declines in retention, I guess is, is the, the positive way to, to spin that. Um, but it's certainly something we're going to be, want to, that we're watching carefully for, for future years and already uh, Jess in particular and in, in, in a little bit in collaboration with me has taken a lot of uh, kind of preliminary steps to be thinking about what we need to do to address workforce issues. Um, and with that, I think, Jess, do you want to talk about uh, LCAS? Sure. And I just wondered um, if we pause just briefly. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry for questions. Yeah. I don't see any new ones. Um, uh, someone did say teacher retention data, overall turnover, or does it take in account for reduction in force? It's overall turnover. Um, so um, it is it is 
uh, I am teacher, uh, I am teacher A was, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching in a school in uh, 1920 and it's asking, am I also teaching in that school in 1819 and 1718? So is this individual teacher, uh, and then it's the aggregation of those individual teachers and principals and superintendents. We were looking at all three of those. Okay, and uh, the next question is why are all the his what are all the historically marginalized groups? So the so um, the, uh, um, so we we the, can just throw some out, right? So you're you're talking yeah. about racial categories. You're talking about free reduced lunch. You're talking about English learners. You might be talking about um, homeless and migrant populations. Uh, I, I think what we can do is uh, pull together a series of hyperlinks um, to the website that has these definitions because there is a, a previous um, presentation that was pulled together that really uh, pulls that out. I, I am not, uh, I don't have great facility with GoTo. Um, I could drop that link now. I'm just not sure if I would be putting it in the right spot. Yeah, we can, I, I can get that list to you. So I, I guess we'll we'll move on. And you're you're driving, Patrick. So um, we'll we'll just try to figure this out. So, like with most sort of policy development, et cetera, we you know we want to start with a theory of action. And for the local comprehensive assessment systems, and particularly because we've just been um, detailing sort of the state approach or snapshot to assessment, we we believe that if each SUSD implements a local comprehensive assessment system including a balance of assessment types, which we've already discussed, that provide information about student proficiency and where a proficiency state in a variety of ways that clearly communicates that performance criteria and provides methods for communicating student progress. If you can just click to the next slide. We believe that Vermont's supervisory unions and supervisory districts will enhance the effectiveness, availability, and equity of services provided to all students. And, and I think that this is where we, we see this connection to an equity agenda that's based on assessing for equity using high quality data. Um, this is, I, I, and I don't want to go into detail, but we're just trying to provide a, a visual in thinking about when you have a local comprehensive assessment system, and it's that getting into finer grain detail when you are using summative data, maybe to ask questions and you want to dig deeper, we know that you really have to have consistent formative assessments for learning with interim benchmark assessments to make sure that you're reflecting back often in teams, often through uh, education support teams or through uh, content discipline teams as you're moving towards that final summative performance assessment. And really, I, I think as Patrick was saying, you, you don't want to wait for the summative performance assessment to be checking in to see how are students progressing towards what you've identified as career and college ready or that proficiency based graduation requirement or critical proficiencies that you've identified so that students are ready for the world. Um, so again, when you're designing this, you wanna think about all students, you wanna be thinking about all content areas, you wanna be thinking about all of those transferable skills that we had defined above. And you wanna make sure that you're not designing a local comprehensive assessment system that that excludes one of these areas. And, it, and it, it's something that happens um, it, even without intent. And I think that's where uh, applying an equity lens tool will be really important as you're thinking about how are we developing our formative interim and summative assessments? How are we ensuring that we know where students are beginning, which is usually like those sort of screeners? How do we understand when students might need, need more additional supports? That's when we're getting into those multi-tiered systems of support, which is those diagnostics. And then how are we making sure that we're checking back in with regularity to make sure that we're providing the adequate supports to move students along where we want to take them, which is that monitoring. Um, so again, just looking at this, you have summative performance assessments and then you have those state summative assessments. I think the key here and something that we're really working to articulate from the agency's perspective, and um, there is always so many things that we could be doing better, is thinking about how do we actually have those performance assessments that aren't really just a, a replication of those state assessments, but getting students used to demonstrating what they know and can do in novel situations. 
So while you have these summative assessments that are at the state level, you frequently want to have your locally defined summative performance assessments that can help students and not sort of shock their system, but also so that when you have a, a state summative assessment, which is really a measure of how a system is doing, that, that you're getting an accurate insight versus simply, and, and this does happen, which is, oh, uh, I don't want to participate or I, I don't believe in summative assessments. And so then a, a system doesn't have uh, accurate data about how it's doing for all of its students. I just want to, I think what Jess is saying here, I just want to, to jump in. It's, it's so super important that, that yes, I mean, we still need to find ways to assess individual students and, and, demonstrate, and, and make sure that we can do their proficiencies. But so much of assessment is really focused on understanding what we need to do to support students and, and drive future learning. It's not a way to get a grade on a report card. All right. Um, I wanted. I don't know if we want to go into this or not. Uh, we, you know, we, I, I, you might be interested that there are these recovery plans that have been um, that your your district's uh, supervisory unions have been working on. Um, although, actually, I realize I'm jumping ahead. I, I, I want to take a, a minute to see if there are questions because we just had was really important information. I do have some questions. Um, some of them go back about earlier discussions, but um, one person um, suggests that you put a list of what the NAs mean on the AOA website. So when someone has an NA, they know why or what it means. Um, um, I think the other ones are individualized questions that I will send to you for um, feedback. Sure. All right. So recovery plans. Um, yeah, I, I assume you've had conversations or are aware of these with these uh, with uh, your district level leadership. Um, every supervisory union right now is uh, put in uh, a needs assessment that they've uh, submitted on the 15th of april or thereabouts um, and are working on actually putting together a recovery plan and this is recovery from this huge upset that we've seen to our system over the course of the last 14 or 15 months however far out we are now um, every school or every system is being asked to identify their needs along three different pillars of student engagement uh, academic achievement and then mental health or social emotional learning for all students and identify what their specific uh, needs are by looking at data to that they you know that they really need to uh, address those um, uh, those those main ideas so if we go back to this picture we saw in the beginning um, the learning standards remain the same um, the assessment, though, the data that we have available is different. There's some SBAC data. You shouldn't probably, I probably shouldn't have, or we shouldn't have a line through uh, SBAC because there's still data of value there. But it's not the same. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. SBAC is not there at all. I was thinking just annual snapshot. SBAC is not available. Integrated field reviews are not available. So schools are really going to need to lean more heavily on their local comprehensive assessment systems in order to get data to understand what their kids are struggling with and where they're having success uh, in order to do that. And then really then uh, the focus is going to be on, you know, kind of healing the whole child and not just making sure that, you know, test scores are good. Um, and thinking about the instructional setting, uh, that might be a priority or a instructional type that takes place in terms of, and looks at uh, improvement priorities and, and funding uh, possibilities. You know, how are we going to use our, our ESSER money um, that uh, all of the districts uh, have coming in, which is really unprecedented amounts of federal money coming into each district in the, uh, across the state or across the country. And really understanding what those, um, you know, those opportunities are uh, that exists um, and the recovery plans themselves need to be addressing each of those three pillars that we talked about um, as we mentioned they're going to have to use diverse data sources because some of those data sources aren't that have been relied on maybe too heavily in the past uh, are not going to be accurate 
it's important to understand that although we hope come September that things will look a lot like a normal classroom, we know that what happens inside is not going to be normal. It's been, uh, you know, it's been a, a huge change. Um, and so um, we know that there's going to take multiple years of work to really kind of figure out what the new normal is going to be going forward. Um, although recovery plans, uh, the, the recovery needs don't need to be specifically funded through the, the different ESSERS funding sources. Uh, we know that that's going to be a, a major one of those and um, uh, UCO. And then I think this last opportunity, and I'm going to throw over to Jess at this point, because this is really um, a really um, generational opportunity to make some substantial changes uh, to assumptions that we've made in the past and the way that we've done things in the past or ideas that we've wanted to take on in the past but haven't had the, uh, you know, the funding or the time or, um, or, or the moment to take care of. And but really to encourage people to think about these as that and you you're you're more articulate around those sort of things than i certainly am just well i don't know about that but um and and now i feel uh destined to disappoint but i would say that you know we, we spent a lot of time on on these data sources and i'm not sure if we've had an opportunity to maybe get at this idea of uh how how folks are setting their equity agendas but i i would say that while we're talking about quantitative data, we don't want to lose sight of some of the qualitative data and, and the importance of, of conversations and engaging and including stakeholders. And I think that this is where there's that opportunity. We've gained a lot of insight. We, we know that there have been historical inequities and equity gaps in this state. We know that they've existed for, in many cases, decades. And we also know that COVID really brought to the surface and created some visibility for folks around this. And I think that this is what Patrick's speaking to, which is to not lose that opportunity, knowing that we have an enormous amount of funding coming into the state, much of that going to the local level, thinking about how can you engage your stakeholder, uh, your stakeholders, engage your community to add not just that quantitative lens, but that qualitative lens. And, and we know too, and as someone who did not serve on a school board, but grew up in a house with a chair of a school board and the um, union rep from the school, uh, that we know that people have diverse and differing perspectives on one issue that happens all the time. And we know that there are some hard conversations happening at the local level, causing some division, et cetera. And I know Susan's gonna be sharing on an article that she had an opportunity to share with Patrick and I, but you know, two things struck me from that article. One is it talks about that data is only as good as your ability to collect it and look at it through a critical lens, but also that it's really important to speak to the language of the heart and that while you want to emphasize that you're going to not only use data to develop a policy agenda, but then to evaluate the effectiveness of that agenda, you also wanna make sure that you're attending to the hearts and minds of your community, because I think at this particular point in time, everyone's really feeling a deep desire to feel cared for. Um, and, and I'm not sure if, People are always understanding that with some of the vocabulary that's out there, people not always understanding concepts. In particular, I think we can see it's really hard to understand the data. It's so dense. Um, I'm going to pause there because, you know, just if there's any parting questions and then also certainly we'd be happy to come back or come back with colleagues. We didn't even have a chance to show you the Vermont education dashboard, which I think gives you uh, even greater insight and detail into the, the data that you all are collecting and then we're representing. Thank you so much, Jess and Patrick. I, I see that we are really out of time. Is there one more question, Carrie? Yes, I see one that just came in. I haven't even read it yet. So let me just read it as, I, as it came in. Has or will the AOE um, provide any guidance to districts regarding the meaningful stakeholder input and involvement? Our district is not adept at community engagement and needs help understanding how to get, um, how to gather and integrate qualitative data. That may be yeah. a question for Sue. Go ahead, Jess. Oh, I was just gonna say, absolutely. And that, that's something we're working on now and also working with, uh, you know, education uh, 
partners across the state because I think there's so many people who are um, interested in this. We'd love to circle circle back on this. I will say too, I had come prepared, but we ran out of time to sort of share how we had done that beginning in 2016, particularly around flexible pathways. Um, so we're happy to come back and we're happy to also uh, share some written materials. Well, you know what, Jess, we are gonna take you up on that. I'll be in touch and we'll schedule a time and we'll keep everybody posted. Um, so we'll pick up with at that point with the Vermont Education Dashboard, is that what you're suggesting? And, and move forward with how to manage the public messaging that can be gleaned from the data that's available to everybody. Absolutely. Perfect. So thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, on your way out, please do take two minutes and give us some feedback so that we can keep making our products better for all of the VSB members, VSBA members and the superintendents who frequent our calls as well as other district personnel. Thank you all, enjoy the sunshine, have a great day. Thank you. Bye.